Greetings. You're watching the Human Element Channel. My name is John Hall. I'm a uh, was a Coast Guard um, accident investigator as well as a helicopter pilot. I um, served a total of 11 years with the Coast Guard. I also graduated from the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy, where I earned a third mate's license and a QMED's endorsement on my Merchant Mariner's document. Um, so I have a little bit of some insight as to what may have gone down with the with the dolly, and I think I have a little bit to add in. Um, so strap in and let's check it out we're sitting up here so at about 24 minute 24 and 59 seconds the um there we go the power is out so they've now lost their initial power they are as has been commented before they are a black hole in the water you cannot steer you cannot drive the ship you cannot run the engines one key thing is that in order for that rudder to be effective, you have to have the engines up and running because you need water flowing over that over those uh, over the rudder. And so right now, there's nothing running over that rudder, and the ship is so big, and that rudder is sitting there. the The ship's actually blocking any effectiveness that the rudder has. So they are basically at the mercy of the of the water and the wind. Um, good news is, as you can sort of see, the winds here are actually very calm, kind of flat, and it's actually consistent with what was, what was reported out of uh, Baltimore, Washington International. Um, so in a moment here, there's the, okay, we just got the power back on, so this may be the emergency generators kicking in. Um, it's most likely, I think, what it is, but realize again that emergency generator is going to be still coming into and partially feeding in through the main switchboard. Some, some additional lights have come on, and we can now see that you've got some exhaust coming out. Now you note that the exhaust is, you know, it's a sign of usually incomplete combustion, um, but the reason why it's sort of moving, it looks like it's moving to the side is because the bow of the ship is actually moving to starboard and the stern is moving to port. So, you know, that's why... I believe that looks like it's moving. Um, at this point, they've probably dropped the anchor. Um, and they're they're making radio calls. And you can see that there's still, still traffic coming across the bridge. So they still haven't managed to get that, um, that closed. And now we've lost power for the second time. So again, this, this is where the vessel is no longer under command. And we're still seeing some exhaust gases coming out, which is an interesting find. Um, which again tells me that maybe the generators are still running, but the power and distribution is not working properly. So, you know, again, I, I, my index of suspicion here is more so on that power management and um, distribution system on board the ship. Um, it just, it, you know, just it strikes me as, as the most likely culprit. Um, so we're coming up here, you know, so at about minute 29 is when they actually impact the bridge. So we're still about 90 seconds away still have cars going over the bridge man those are the luckiest drivers in baltimore and what i can tell you you know at this point the pilots and they 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 are in a total panic um and they're powerless they there's nothing that they can do i'm kind of looking there i'm trying to f it actually looks like yeah, my guess is the emergency generator is running because you, it looks like there is a light that's still operating there up on the bow, illuminating the work area. Um, and we'll, we'll see that go out when they impact with the bridge, which is going to be very soon here. And again, I think what happened, one of the other interesting things, people have talked about the, the dolphins being able to protect them, and it may very well be. But realize that these ships have really large rakes on their bow. So in other words, the bow flares outward away from, and so that, you know, those dolphins, you're relying on them to stop the ship. And there it impacts. And 
now the bridge comes down. Man. All right, everybody. So welcome to Human Element. This is our first episode. Uh, my name's John, and I am... Uh, some of you may also know me from another podcast that I have sometimes appeared on, and that's uh, So There I Was. Uh, so I'm not a stranger to YouTube, but um, here's here's what I'm attempting to do here. So I am a uh, prior um, U.S. Coast Guard accident investigator. I also flew helicopters for them. Um, and I'm a graduate from the United States Merchant Marine Academy. And so I've actually sailed on about eight or nine different ships, circumnavigated the globe. And when I graduated from Kings Point, I had a, uh, which is the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy, I had a uh, third base license with a QMED endorsement on my Merchant Mariner's document, which means I was sort of the highest level of uh, non-licensed individuals in the uh, engine room. So that said, um, I have a little bit of some insight as to what may have gone on with the motor vessel dolly. Um, so again, um, we're going to talk about the motor vessel dolly and the key bridge, um, and we're going to untangle some things because there's a lot of information out there that is not so great, and that's what I'm hoping to tackle uh, with you today. So, uh, so you, let's say you don't want to stay for the whole thing. Well, I can appreciate that. I have you covered here. So first we're going to do an S bar. So uh, S bar is a way of saying that we are going to, I'm going to give you a quick brief on what exactly occurred in case you've been living under a rock. So situation is, is that the motor vessel Dolly, this is about a 110,000 dead weight ton container ship, uh, was departing Dundalk Marine Terminal in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, when it experienced some mechanical problems, um, it subsequently drifted out of the shipping lane and its starboard bow impacted with the southern support on the uh, key bridge, um, which then also resulted in the complete loss of the key bridge. Um, this is significant because Baltimore is a very big shipping port uh, carrying a lot of bulk cargo, um, coal, grain, um, also a lot of cars. It's probably one of the largest car terminals on the East Coast. Um, so in reality, it compromised about 3% of our total shipping capacity in the United States, but while it doesn't sound like a lot, it's a lot. Um, more importantly than that, there are uh, six people who lost their lives in this, two others were injured. Um, basic background here, you know, Dolly is a uh, Neo Panamax container ship. This is a very large um, container ship. Um, it is not, it is flagged under in, with Singapore um, and had Singapore crew and um, there have been some misconceptions out there that um, somehow Ukraine was involved. They were not. Um, the ship is actually operated and owned by Grace Ocean Shipping um, as well as Synergy Corporation. These are the two primary people who are responsible for maintenance and operating the ship. Um, there's been some speculation that Maersk was involved with this. This is not correct. Maersk had a contract with the ship for the ship to carry some of its cargo. That's it. Um, the dimensions of the dolly, about 194 feet, 184 feet length overall, beam of 48 feet, draft of 49 feet, 4 inches. That's significant. So that's maximum draft. Um, the draft in the key channel going, or the federal channel going out of Baltimore is 50 feet. Um, the dolly was not fully loaded at the time of elision, but it was pretty heavily loaded. Um, overall assessment at this point, there's a unified command that's in place. Uh, it includes the Port, of, Port Authority of Baltimore, the U.S. Coast Guard, the Army Corps of Engineers, the NTSB, and representatives from the shipping company. Um, two of the, what I do know at this time, uh, two of the deceased have been recovered. There are still four missing. Um, the response and recovery to this is complicated. Um, it's been basically broken down into three phases. If they are, you know, I, I think this is an oversimplification on the part of the Army Corps of Engineers. They're saying we're going to clear the channel, we're going to refloat the Dali, and then we're going to remove the remaining wreckage. And um, that's sort of like saying, well, I'm going to get a shovel, shovel my driveway, and figure my way out, you know, something along that lines. It's just a little bit of an oversimplification. 
what I think is important to take away is that the wreckage here, this is a really, really complex situation. So you've got a lot of mass sitting on top of the ship. You've got um, cargo containers that are compromised, hazardous materials are often sometimes stored at the front of the ship. Um, these are not like ethyl, methyl, death, death type um, uh, hazmat, but you know, they're classified as hazardous material cargo and they've probably been compromised and so we have to be very discreet in how we're going to go about removing this. I think the biggest thing to take away from this though is the wreckage underneath in the channel is going to be very very difficult to remove as well as very dangerous um, and you know this is going to be one of these things where we're going to say you know um, slow is smooth and smooth is fast so you know, we really want to be very deliberate and well thought out in what we're doing, and we do not want to rush through this. Um, so let's jump over to uh, the TLDR. In case you don't know what TLDR is, that's too long, didn't read, meaning I'm just going to give you the basic bullets of what I think happened, and then I'm going to try and support that further on down in my presentation. So <clears throat> when you look at the event sequence, um, of the uh, bridge or the ship and the bridge impacting, I think it's pretty clear that there was an electrical power failure of some sort. Now, what the origin or etiology or root cause of that remains to be determined. However, um, my index of suspicion is primarily in the power management and distribution. So realize that these ships have two large, um, two primary main generators and two auxiliary generators. Then there's also an emergency backup generator. The emergency backup generator powers essentials um, and you're not gonna get, you know, the whole plant back up and running just by running the emergency generator. You know, you'll get maybe fire pumps and some communication systems and lighting. And I'm gonna go over that in a little more detail. Um, but what's important, what's the important takeaway here is that these are very, very, very large um, engines that drive this ship. And so large that you could quite literally crawl inside one of the cylinders um, for these engines and I, they probably have about eight or nine of those cylinders. Um, so these engines are massive. They in turn require a lot of auxiliary support systems. This includes lube oil, this includes fuel oil systems, and this includes pneumatic air control systems and a whole host of other um, monitoring and other, other sensors that are there to help keep the plant up and running. The, those engines do not deliver electrical power to keep themselves running. They rely on the generators to do that. So if we sort of tease that back, the loss of the electrical power give, gives way to the loss of propulsion. And I think you know there's been some discussion about whether the fuel contamination was an issue. Um, it seems as though fuel contamination may have been um, a possibility. I think it's less likely. They've checked the um, fuel from where they, you know, they've checked the fuel on the ship and the, um, in the harbor from what I've seen in some reports, and uh, the fuel had tested okay. Um, doesn't necessarily mean that maybe there isn't contamination, inter more t contamination to be considered internally inside the tanks. Um, but when you break down the systems and you really look at them, you will realize that, you know, when you have two or three different generators all running at the same time, they have to be brought together and then distributed throughout the ship. And that is, I think, most likely the weak link here. Um, so I think, you know, when we sort of break it down, uh, if you guys have ever gone over to Juan Brown's channel, um, the Blanco Lirio channel, when he talks about these, you know, does these quick one minute or a few minute spots on accidents and mishaps, you know, what are the investigators really going to be looking at? I think they're going to be really zeroing in on the electrical power systems and distribution. Um, I'll go into much more detail on that, but again, I'm just giving you the TLDR here. Um, other stuff to consider, um, you know, so here's the one other thing that I think this kind of boils down to. There's been lots of other theories and things that have been thrown out there. Um, I kind of go back to um, 
something that's called Occam's razor, which is, you know, the most likely cause is likely the root cause. Or said another way, if I'm in North America and I hear hoofbeats, I probably want to think horses and not zebras. So I think when we start considering some of these other things like um, whether or not there was sabotage or something like that, I think it's highly, highly unlikely. I, it, of course, cannot be ruled out. Um, there was also one thing brought up, speculation that there was involvement with Ukraine. No, no involvement with Ukraine. Sorry. Um, there was at one point a master who was from Ukraine, but eh, he's not there now. Um, the master is from Singapore. Um, so, you know, the, the ultimate takeaway from this is that, you know, I think the ship and the bridge had some key weaknesses and those two weaknesses happened to line up just right in a perfect storm. Um, what is amazing and I think is important to, be, to point out is that the pilots, um, acted very quickly. They were able to make notification to the um, port or to the you know the bridge authorities, and they were able to shut down the bridge. And fortunately, they were doing maintenance, so they had police there, and they could quickly shut down the bridge. Um, otherwise, you know, this could have been a catastrophe. There's also been some speculation that you know this is like a one in a, you know uh, some sort of event that we've never seen before, and there's you know a lot of uh, discussion like the uh the orange one and what i'll point out is that there have been other bridge elisions and in fact and there have been ships who have lost power the just the week following this mishap um an american president line ship coming out of the port of new york lost its power plant um, but nothing happened um this just happened to really kind of be the perfect storm but I'm going to dig a little bit deeper into that. And so if you are just looking for the TLDR, now is the point for you to check out. And we'll see ya. All right. So let's jump over here to pre-elision. Um, so motor vessel um, Dolly departs Seagirt Terminal at uh, 0107. It's outbound in the Fort McHenry Channel. This is what the NTSB had put out. And then the Dolly gets underway. That's on a heading of 141 True, heading of about eight, or making way at about eight knots. And uh, we then find that at about uh, 0124 and 59 seconds, the electrical power is lost. Oral alarms, so there's auditory alarms that are heard on the bridge, and the voyage data system stops getting data. It doesn't mean that it stops recording. It's still recording. It's just recording a whole bunch of zeros, and it's recording the audio that's on the bridge. The problem is, is that the entire plant, the entire ship, is a black floating hole, and there's no all of the sensors that are utilized to report engine RPMs and temperatures or whatever data is fed into the VDR, well, that's lost um, because those sensors are no longer feeding any data. Um, at 0126 and two seconds, so uh, about two minutes later, the VDR um, ship system data is restored and there are steering and rudder commands being given. So a um, couple, you know, one thing is it's not that the they were not doing any steering or rudder commands, but um, you can't give, you cannot execute on any of these things because the wheel, the ship's wheel, you can turn it and the throttle, you could move it, but it's not going to do anything because nothing's working at that point. All right. Um, so at 0, 1, 26 and 39 seconds, the harbor pilots call the tug um, for assistance. Um, I'm going to go into tugs a little bit further down. Um, and, you know, pilots also then make the order to drop the port anchor, um, which I think was a good call. But I'm going to talk a little bit about why that didn't make any difference um, or didn't do what they were hoping it would do. Uh, let's see. Jump over here to the next one. So 0127 and 25 seconds, pilot issues a radio call over the VHF radio. Um, all the power is lost, and they are going to then pass the information over to um, the uh, uh, bridge authorities so that they can shut the traffic down. Um, all right. And so at 0129, um, 
So this is where all of a sudden all the power is lost again at 0, 0.127 and 25 seconds. And then at 0, 0.129, the dolly is adrift. And at this point, what we would say, we say the vessel is not under command. So uh, in nautical speak, what that means is that we're not able to control what we are doing, okay? So there is a very discreet term for that. It doesn't mean that everybody left the ship or the bridge. All right, so at uh, 0129.33, um, auditory sounds can be heard that are consistent with the bridge elision. Um, and 0129.39, the pilot reported that the key bridge was down. So those are some of the key points that we sort of had from the NTSB in the timeline. Um, so the elision here occurred between the Dolly's starboard bow and the support on the south side of the federal channel. Um, and the energy that was contained within this was massive. Uh, so a lot of people may be looking at this going, my God, how could this have brought down the bridge? I assure you, sorry, I keep moving this around. I assure you there's a reason. Um, and we'll talk about that. But what I will tell you is that the amount of energy that was contained in the elision was about equivalent to a Tomahawk missile. Um, and I'll prove that to you as we get along here. So, um, here we go. So now we got to kind of get a little nerdy, uh, cause in order for you to understand some of the details and the nuance of this, um, we have to kind of get into understanding shipboard systems, how they work, why these systems are so complex. And once we do that, I think the error sequence that we see will start to make a little more sense to you. All right, so um, in order to um, run the main engines, as I had mentioned earlier, they need a lot of supports, um, support systems around them. Um, they need lube oil, they need fuel oil, they need pneumatic air systems. I will even tell you that the even the lubrication oil lubrication system on these engines is like a whole separate system unto the main engine. And it includes lube oil purifiers and pumps. Um, and the complexity of these engine systems is absolutely mind boggling, um, as is also um, their size. If you look here, you know, you can this is a drive shaft for a slow speed diesel engine. Um, this is actually, you know, you can sort of see this is like a nice picture or diagram over here of a, a slow speed diesel engine. Um, but again, it doesn't necessarily give you the context for what we are looking at. And when you look over here, um, you can see this guy, this is a cylinder liner, um, for a slow speed diesel engine. And he's actually inside there. And in one of the What's kind of funny is this, so on one of my terms that when I was out at sea, um, I was actually inside, I, I remember being inside a cylinder liner and scrubbing it to because we were, we had actually on this one trip, we had replaced three cylinder liners and it's a massive job. It is an absolutely massive job. Um, and it, you know, it's an all hands on deck evolution. Um, and even one of those cylinder liner replacements was done while we were underway. Um, so you can actually isolate one of these cylinders and shut it off and the other cylinders can all still be running. It's, um, you know, so it's, it's, you know, you still have to go in and disconnect the piston. I can't remember the exact specifics on it, but, um, it, it's pretty intense. Um, so, you know, the shipboard electrical, let's talk also now, um, about the, uh, electrical systems on these ships. So these, electrical systems are massive and complex it's not only do you have these massive engines that are on board these ships driving them but you also have a whole electrical grid um, that really is almost more like you know trying to power a small city um, as i mentioned there are two main generators two auxiliary generators um, this is supporting, you know, there almost isn't a system on the ship that doesn't require electricity. Um, you know, for example, the bow thrusters. Bow thrusters are going to be operated with electric motors. Um, those motors are huge um, and realize, you know, those are designed to push the bow left or right as they're 
uh, at slow speed, so while they're maneuvering. And um, those require a lot of energy. So, you know, in all likelihood, if I were to speculate, my guess is they probably had, the Dolly probably had maybe both main um, generators on and one auxiliary engine, or maybe one auxiliary generator, or maybe just a main and an aux um, with at least one other diesel generator in a standby mode. Um, so, you know, they're going to have some reserve capacity built in because they're going to anticipate that maybe something, you know, Murphy was an optimist and never, nothing ever really goes to plan. So, um, just, and even these primary generators are, are huge. You know, these are not small machines to operate either, you know, and each of these, um, generators are putting out about, uh, 5,500 kilowatts, anywhere between 5,500 to 4,500 kilowatts a piece. Um, when I, when I did look up on some of the stuff on the Dolly, the, um, main generators, um, are actually putting out 4,500 kilowatts and the auxiliaries are putting out 5,500 kilowatts. So, um, my guess, you know, the, the reason for that, I would suspect, um, is that the engines on here are when you're running these engines you're using up a lot of fuel fuel is money and you know we so if we don't need to have a 5500 kilowatt generator running all the time um you know we'll shut it down we'll end up being more economical that way all right so let's talk a little bit about how the electrical system is shut is set up because i think this is where we need to understand what may have happened um all right so here you have your shore connections okay then you have your emergency generator and then an auxiliary generator and then you have your main generators then you have your main switchboard here okay and there's also a switchboard that connects the main <coughs> into that now realize that with these switchboards each of these generators is putting out three phases of electrical power Okay, so they, as I mentioned, they put out three phases of electrical power. That means that there are three separate lines from each generator going out. And though that is AC power, and so that is cycling, or it's like it's you know basically got a sine wave. And so it is moving, and each of those phases is about 120 degrees off from the other phase. So now realize that when you go to bring you have this generator running, and now I want to bring this generator online. I have to synchronize those generators. And those generators have to remain synchronized during the operation. And if those generators are not synchronized, you know, two kind of two things can happen. Either you're going to have a lot of sparky, arky stuff going on, and you're going to damage a lot of equipment, or in a lot of cases, some of these ships are designed so that everything trips off the line if you're not able to synchronize these generators. So I think the investigators are really going to need to look at this pow the power management and distribution throughout the ship. And as you can see just from this diagram, it's rather complicated. And so you're going to have, and it's very technical, and you're going to have to get into the manuals, the diagrams, you're really going to have to trace out these systems. And, you know, it's, it, these are, this is not a simple task. You know, so then as the power comes out of the main switchboard, now that we've got them synchronized up and the generators are running in what we refer to as being in parallel or running side by side, now that power has to be distributed throughout the ship. And you can see in this, you know, on this diagram, there are all sorts of, different things that we're we're running you know so you have one board that's going to the galley you've got you know uh yeah you know, equipment that's you know another line that's going up to the bridge you know the radars are very power hungry um you know all of your engine support systems are going to be in there as well and then take a look at how this emergency generator that's over here. Now, it's depicted as the same size as this. They're not. They're probably not much bigger than like a Ford F-150, okay? These are pretty small generators. Um, again, they're just supporting essential equipment. 
um, and they're not really intended to run or operate the ship that way. Um, all right, so now we talked about that. So you can sort of, in the other way to sort of think about this in the bigger structure of the, of the ship's electrical system is you have a feeder side, so that's where the generators are, and then you have the load side. And this is where all of the equipment and all of the things that you're trying to run are coming from, okay? And, you know, again, the, um, the, the, one of the bigger things is that the emergency generators are not there to run the entire ship, okay? So, trust me, we're getting there. I'm sorry. I know this is kind of a long. So, the real question you may be asking yourself is why the hell does any of this actually matter? Well, this is some of the stuff that these investigators are really going to have to be looking at and digging into. But there's some other things as well. So, you know, we're going to, we, we talked a little bit about the fuel. Um, I think for the most part, the fuel appears as though it was okay. Um, I don't think that fuel contamination is necessarily going to be an issue. The generators themselves, they're pretty simple devices. You know, while they're big and robust and have a lot of power to them, um, the generators themselves is really not much more than a diesel engine connected to a, uh, a dyna, um, I'm not even sure, so the, to the generator that's actually producing electricity. You're turning like a, um, a dynamo um, and you're generating electricity that way. It's, it's pretty, those are pretty reliable and typically don't just shut down on their own. In particular, when you consider that you know, one or two of those gener like one of those generators probably was able to generate enough electricity to support the entire ship. Um, I'm pretty certain that I would imagine that they would have two up. Um, but so I, I think the generators are, are less likely on my list of, uh, of likely, likely problems. You know, the power distribution and management is, I think, a big piece of this puzzle. Um, and that's really where um, I'm certain they're going to be concentrating. And then the maintenance, um, they're going to be looking through the maintenance records. You know, when was the last time that, you know, the systems were serviced? There was an interesting note, um, and it hasn't, there hasn't been more coverage on it. It's kind of disappointing. Um, but in the port of Baltimore, it was suggested that the ship shut down, had lost power, or had some power failures while they were dockside. Um, so I think they're going to be having to go back and look at that and talk to those people who may have noted that and see if they can't sort that out. Um, you know, another big piece of this is the people factor and that's, you know, the human factors. It's entirely possible that, you know, somebody in the engine room inadvertently flipped the wrong switch, turned the wrong dial, or somebody brought, you know, did something that tripped the whole system to trip offline. And so I think that needs to be, they're going to be looking at that. Um, voyage data recorders, I think, you know, you're going to get some, still get some decent information out of it. Um, what I can tell you is, you know, you know, I, I, so I was, it was probably, it's more than 20 years ago that I was doing accident investigations. And um, the, uh, the VD, we, you know, we didn't really have a VDR. Um, in fact, I had an investigation that I did it was a mid-channel grounding of a grain ship um, in, uh, in Portland, Oregon. Um, and, you know, all that I had to work with was the, uh, the, uh, the log from the bridge and the course recorder. There, there is a course recorder. Um, I think they're also going to be needing to look at the weather. Um, I actually went and looked at the, the weather in Baltimore at or around the time of that event. And... Uh, the weather was somewhere, it was, w the winds were pretty calm. Um, now, when you look at the video, you see that, that smoke um, or the exhaust coming out of the uh, main stack and it's moving towards the left of the screen. Um, where I think, what I think is driving that is the bow of the ship is, the, the ship is turning to starboard. Um, and with that, they ended up, um, that's where I think that movement of, of the exhaust was coming from. Um, so let's actually also, you know, take a look at a concept from the aviation community. Um, so, you know, when we look at, you know, a, there is a, a sequence of events that typically has to happen. You know, one thing leads to the next thing, leads to the next thing. And so there's this event sequence. And if you just link up enough links in the chain, 
it propagates to the mishap. And, you know, while, you know, this is, I think, a very general idea, um, you know, or concept that you're seeing sort of laid out here, um, it, it does bring home the idea that, you know, there is an event sequence and a linkage of these events. Um, now, we don't want to confuse that with this. And that is within an organization and within industry standards, um, we have certain things that we do as a matter of routine or process or as best practice. And organizations have policies in place that help us prevent us from, you know, that help prevent an event like this from happening. And then there's, you know, good diligent work on the part of people who were operating the ship. And at any one given time, there's always a gap in every layer of protection that we have to preventing a mishap from happening. And when those just line up right, that's when we all of a sudden have a mishap. And, you know, this is, this instance is, is really no different. All right. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, so there's going to be, and this may not be um, well understood, but there's going to be two parallel investigations that are going on. So the NTSB is going to have is going to be investigating. They're pr they are primarily looking at this from a safety perspective. Um, the Coast Guard is going to also be doing an investigation, um, and in fact, you know theirs will actually have potential legal ramifications. There will also be safety recommendations that will come out of that investigation. Um, so an interesting thing that um, you know, so Coast Guard investigators. Um, are actually able, they have subpoena authority, and it's actually pretty simple to do. You can just write out, you know, I, you, there's a whole form for it. You write it out, you sign it. I didn't even have to take it to a judge, um, you know, and it's actually written into the, the, the Code of Federal Regulations there. Um, and in fact, I had one case where uh, when I was doing an investigation, I actually did issue a subpoena. Um, the attorney representing the individual that I put the subpoena on tried to have it quashed. And um, when it went to the court, it was not quashed. Um, it was actually held up and I got the information that I needed to complete my investigation. It was kind of, kind of interesting. Um, so let's also talk, you know, like I mentioned with the Voyage Data Recorder, it's recording Date, sensor data that's being fed to it and if there's nothing there to feed the data in then you're you're getting goose eggs um you know but there's still some valid information in there um is there room for improvement on this could we generate something that is a little bit more robust like the black boxes that are on a commercial aircraft absolutely um you know <laughs> uh it, just like the mass of these um, ships, uh, the inertia of trying to make change in industry, um, uh, such as the maritime industry, is, is really difficult. Um, all right. Um, so we talked about fuel. And again, I my index of suspicion is I think this is less likely a, a fuel thing. Um, all right. So let's talk about the top three suspects. So... Generators, definitely on my list, um, but again, they're pretty reliable. Fuel system, um, you know, was there, could there be, an, you know, a failure of one of the fuel pumps? Could there be problem with contaminated fuel? Absolutely. Um, and could that end up shutting down the entire generators? Yeah. Um, however, I think my top suspect is uh, power distribution and management. Um and, you know, I, I just, in terms of the potential for error, you know, for something to go wrong in just how complex the power distribution is, um, you know, my index of suspicion is, is there. Uh, I, I may be wrong. I'm not, I'm not opposed to that. But it's, I think it, it is definitely something that the investigators can be looking at. So how did we actually get here? How did this actually happen? And this is what I kind of want to key in on. So we ended up with a single point of failure for both the Dolly and the Key Bridge. So single point failure is when 
one critical system fails and it can bring the whole system down. And in the case of the Dali, it appears that it's somewhere in the electrical system. In the case of the key bridge, there was a key vulnerability there that a ship that was large enough, big enough, and with enough energy could bring it down. And so, and it's sometimes it's hard for us to wrap our heads around something like that. You know, we, you know, think back to 9-11. You know, did we really think that the Twin Towers were coming down? Probably not. Um, so, you know, one of the things that we have to sort of work against and, you know, when you're looking at this from a safety perspective and now trying to take lessons learned and move them forward, you need to make sure that you don't fall victim to failure of imagination. Um, the Apollo 1 launch pad fire, um, where they were doing a plugs out test at 100% oxygen, and there was an ignition source and high pressure oxygen and lots of fuel, and they ended up having that capsule fire. And um, Frank Borman, in the following investigation, had pointed out that there was a failure of imagination. They had always assumed that they were going to die somewhere in space, um, but they didn't think that it, there was any hazards of you know doing a, uh, a standard test that they did every day in the uh, you know on the launch pad. So again, sort of something to sort of think about there. All right, so let's go into the what ifs. So. One what if that has definitely been thrown out is why didn't they have escort tugs? Well, <clears throat> I think it's a fair question. Um, you know, realize one thing though. You know, the tugs maybe bring about 5,000, maybe 8,000 horsepower. They may have been able to potentially redirect where the ship was going. Um, but realize you're talking about 110,000 dead weight tons moving at seven and a half knots. So when the tugs are maneuvering these sh large ships into and out of port, the ships aren't moving. They're, they're almost at a dead stop. So, you know, they're, you're, yeah, you're moving a large amount, but, you know, you're not, you're not ha don't have that kinetic energy built up. Um, I, I think had a tug been there and had a tug tried to redirect i'm certain absolutely certain that they would have done that but you know had they been there and had they made that sort of an attempt um i think it just would have resulted in another casualty and so you know i think there's going to have to be a little bit of a closer look and a detailed analysis on it um but i'm not 100 percent convinced um that a tug would have made that much of a difference um, the anchors, you know, we, they did drop, um, the port anchor and in the hopes that, you know, it would potentially steer the bow around to the port and away from the bridge. Um, you know, the, the problem again, this is, it's a basic physics, basic physics equation, equation, which <clears throat> we're going to get to in a moment. Um, but that is, is sort of the key point, you know, so there's, there's just, you know, some of these systems, you know, their uh, anchor on, a, on these ships is designed to help hold it in place when it's still. It's not a set of brakes. Um, these ships don't come with brakes. And, you know, once they're underway and, you know, you do a crash stop with them, you're looking at two, three miles just to bring them to a stop. So, again, now <laughs> there's been some other crazy things that have been suggested um i would throw in no it's not colonel mustard in the uh, engine room with the um candlestick um nor do i think there were ufos and i don't think hugo chavez had anything to do with it um there was a mention uh, you know that somehow there was a connection with this to ukraine this is not true um there is no evidence that supports or backs that up um complete singapore crew nothing to do with ukraine um and you know, it's not a matter of, you know, sometimes it's really hard sometimes to prove a negative, you know. So how do I prove that Ukraine wasn't involved? You know, the first thing I have to do is prove that they were involved. And then when I can't accept that they weren't. So 
Um, anyways, so that's, you know, there's our tinfoil hat theories. Okay, so let's talk about how much kinetic energy was actually um, dissipated in this. So don't worry, I did all of the math work for you. So Dolly weighs about 110,000 deadweight tons, um, which equates to about, you know, 110 million kilograms. Um, that's moving at about seven and a half knots, which translates to about 3.8 meters per second. Um, we know that kinetic energy is about one, is one half times mass times velocity squared. Um, with a little bit of extra legwork, I determined that one gram of TNT yields about 4,184 joules. Um, so, you know, running the numbers, um, the actual um, amount of energy um, contained in a 110,000 deadweight ton container ship moving at seven and a half knots is uh, uh, 819 million joules. So that's a lot of, lot of energy. So we take that, we divide it by the TNT yield, um, which then gives us uh, 195,865 grams or 195 kilograms of TNT. And then take that and we divide that by, um, we can just divide it by a thousand for, for the get the kilogram number. And then you multiply that by 2.2 and you get 430.9 pounds of TNT. So after doing, a, that's pretty close to about a half a ton of TNT. And um, when I went and did a little legwork, found out that uh, the tomahawk delivers about a half a ton of high kinetic freedom to its target. So there you go. So I rest my case. If you want to prove me wrong, go for it. All right. So how are we going to figure this out in the end? Well, the bottom line is, is in what, and it's going to take, we're going to, it's going to take time. Okay. But I think we need to duplicate the failure. And along with that, and also just to sort of trace down where, the fault is we're going to have to partner with industry so we have some really talented really smart investigators um, out there that are working on these cases um, but you saw some of the diagrams that I put up there these systems are massively complex and each system is a little bit unique or different than the next and so we're going to have to rely on you know sort of the industry to help us sort of sort this out. And this is not an uncommon practice. So even in the aviation industry, when, you know, Boeing aircraft crashes, you know, Boeing goes out and they, and of course, Boeing, maybe not the greatest time to use an example for Boeing, but, um, you know, they go out and they, uh, you know, they go out and assist the investigators with the case. Um, but there's also still some things for us to take away. And so, Let's contextualize this into something else. Let's talk about what we call high-risk organizations or operations. So what are HROs? HROs are, they're, you know, we know how to fly airplanes. We know how to drive ships. We know how to operate nuclear power plants, okay? That's not the issue. And we know the systems, policies, and procedures that we have to follow to be successful in that. But... The problem is that these organizations and these types of operations have really one way to get it right, but about a hundred ways to get it wrong. And if we don't, you know, we now have to really sort of think culturally about what does it really mean when we're in these high risk organizations and operations. And a lot of times, especially for this, these types of organizations, one of the bigger things that bites you in the butt is complacency um you know it's the same way we get underway from port every time so why would we do anything different and sometimes you gotta think a little bit you gotta you know the term i like to use here is you gotta shatter your paradigm so you gotta you create this mental model and sometimes if that mental model is not working out break it and rebuild it okay so Again, that's, you know, what can we learn at this point? So here's an interesting point. So, again, we sort of look at this, oh, my God, you know, the um, key bridge came down. You know, this has never happened before. And the reality is anything but the truth. So this has happened before. You know, we have the um, Sunshine Highway Bridge elision with a ship. 
And we also have, there was a train trestle that was um, struck by a barge and the train ended up um, going off the derailing and ending up into the river. Um, <clears throat> this occurred, I believe, in Alabama in 1980, 1998 or so. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, these are not one-off events. And so, you know, we need to sort of, you know, now contextualize that appropriately. And that is that, you know, these disasters aren't, aren't one off. They are happen along. You know, there was a book that was written by David Alexander on disaster and emergency management. And, um, you, know, d- you know, disasters are not one off events. They happen in repeatable and predictable patterns. But what often happens is we fail to step back to that macroscopic view and look at the bigger picture. Um, you know, Hurricane Katrina is a great example of this, because if you look at um, Katrina, it was very similar to Hurricane Camille, which took out New Orleans in a very similar fashion. So it's not anything new. Um, I would also add that, you know, safety is a, is a cultural mindset. It's something that's got to be baked into your organization or to your operation or to how you practice. This is one of the things that I'm really going to work very hard to try and explore um with this you know podcast that i'm starting or youtube channel or whatever the heck you want to call it um and then lastly you know the other thing i and and this is something that i sort of have come up with but it's and it's my mantra which you know safety doesn't happen by accident it happens as a part of a overt and iterative of iterative oh that's great so yeah i misspelled that one iterative process so in other means other words it's a repeat process so um gotta uh, work with the uh producers on the uh slides make sure they know what they're doing next time all right so really um so where do you where would you might want to go for more information on this first off highly recommend going to sal mercagliano over at what's going on with shipping um he's all over youtube um and then you have mark mccoy also known as chief mccoy um he does some fantastic stuff about merchant marine engine room um and great uh great content over there and then we have steam man um who also does some uh marine engineering content and what's really unique about for him with his channel is he's on a you know he does talks about steam steam turbines and steamships um and you know that is a something that is dying um we're not seeing a whole lot of uh steam driven ships i actually did sail on a steam driven ship during my uh, cadet sea years um if you're looking for similar content but maybe different um you know different content area juan brown over block Illyrio does a fantastic job um peter hornfeld also known as mentor pilot um does all sorts of great deep dives on aviation stories and then you got ward carroll um who just has his own channel ward carroll um and he does a nice job of uh some presentations on on different current you know basically current event journalism so um so anyway so you got my first episode hope you liked it probably didn't i'm sure i'm gonna get all sorts of hate in the comments but um if i did something that doesn't make sense you hated you want to scream at me about um please by all means all that i ask is just be constructive if you want to if you want to critique me on something tell me you know oh that was terrible or i didn't like when you like that be more specific let me know what it is that i did different and then i can get better i'm i'm trainable um one other uh, plug I'm going to make. Um, so I, I do partner with another podcast. Um, and uh, that one is um, all more so about fun aviation stories, but there's some really great lessons in there as well. So if you check that out, there's a podcast called So There I Was, because it's how all great aviation tales begin. Um, and so there you go. So we'll see you on the next one.